Hello and welcome to the Collaborative Leadership Webinar. This is a really important topic. Uh, you know, Jack, we have been messing around looking at our 360 data for a long time now. We have data from 111,000 leaders across the globe. Wow. And this has been a really important topic, and we wanted to focus in on this today and, and just talk about the importance of collaborative leadership. Now, in the process of doing this, we have a self-assessment we'd like you to, to, to take. It's easy to do. It takes about, oh, seven minutes to complete. The link is on your uh, site right now, bit.ly slash collab assessment. And uh, basically, you'll fill out a few questions, and you can get the results on your screen. If you do put in uh, your email address, it'll send the results to your email, which is a little bit easier. If you print them out on your screen, be sure to capture the numbers before that disappears. Uh, so please take that collaborative assessment, and as we start this webinar, you should be able to finish it by the time we ask for that data. Let me just start by talking about the objectives of the webinar today. This is a micro-learning experience. Now, sometimes you go to a webinar, you sit back, you listen, you just kind of absorb the information. This is not that kind of webinar. In this webinar, really, we don't want you to be an observer. We want you to be a participant. And so we're encouraging you to make this a learning experience, which means that we'd like you to engage enough that you're actually going to select one area where you could improve your collaboration and actually work on it. Now, the insights from the webinar come from our data. We've compiled a huge data set. We've been analyzing this data with leaders from across the globe. We've looked at the importance of collaboration. We find that our 360 is incredibly predictive, and this is one of the most important competencies. Now, we'd like to encourage everyone, uh, oftentimes, most organizations, we need more collaboration. That's typically what we, we suggest. But we have kind of a hidden jewel in here because sometimes we found that too much collaboration can be kind of a problem. We're going to explain that as we go along. Uh, we want you to understand the impact of these four factors. We've discovered four factors that enable collaboration. Uh, you're going to get your self-assessment results. You're going to identify one uh, dimension to improve on. And then we're going to provide you a context and a process and a development guide to help you improve. So just one last reminder here. If you're just joining the webinar, we'd like you to do a self-assessment. You can see the link on your page there. Uh, and when you get to the end of the survey, you'll see your results. If you give your email address, the results will be sent to your email. And that, that's going to encourage, you know, it's a real good uh, self-assessment, so we encourage you to complete that. Uh, this is Jack, and we're here to talk about collaborative leadership. And it's always a good thing to do to, to begin by being in agreement about our definition. So on the screen, you see a, a definition that, that comes from a, uh, earlier HBR article that we really liked. And uh, we like the fact that, that the authors talk about the fact that collaborative le leadership is engaging people who are not within your power base. They're not people who report to you. And it's being able to kind of influence them and inspire them to work with you toward a common goal. And despite the fact that these groups often have very different ideas, convictions, cultural values, operating norms. So that sets the context for what we're talking about today. Uh, you now see here on your screen a comment from a CEO. And I, I smile about this because it's, it's very similar to an experience I had many years ago when I was part of a group that merged together some 21 companies in our industry with the expectation that we would have lots of cross-selling and lots of collaboration. And that just did not exactly work <laughs> out. Um, the comment from the CEO that you can see up on the screen is that uh, he or she talks about having acquired a, a variety of businesses that were indeed related to each other. Uh, and they clearly overpaid for them if 
there was no collaboration between them uh, going down down the road. And indeed, that that's a, a, a stark uh, reality that faces lots of organizations that acquire businesses. They just don't get the kind of collaboration that they had anticipated. Uh, as Joe mentioned, we have in, encouraged you to, to take this little self-assessment that really kind of looks at your preference for independence or interdependence. And you'll see there on the screen the, the items that call out what we mean when we talk about independence. Preference to work alone. Uh, likes to be collaborative by adding my work to, to your work. Um, educational experiences are often uh, powerful because they reinforce that independent streak that we, we have. Yeah, do your own work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you don't, you're, you're cheating. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you see that listed there the, the characteristics that somewhat kind of describe and define this characteristic of independence. Uh, it's very much embedded in our Western uh, culture. On the other side, we have the interdependence column. Uh, in this case, we have people who prefer to work with each other, work in teams. Uh, they prefer collaborating, uh, work, people working all together. Uh, th they tend to be more social, um, and they are comfortable asking other people to help them and, and help give them insights and give them assistance in what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and so th this, again, Probably, if you were thinking about a culture that really espouses this, we, we think of the Eastern uh, Asian cultures as being particularly uh, inclined to, to this kind of behavior. Uh, the, the danger is that it can lead to a collaborative overload. Yeah, that is interesting <clears throat> how in the Western culture you think about that farmer there's 20, 40 miles from anybody else. They don't see, they just work by themselves uh, in, in that Western mentality. Uh, two of my former partners, Gene Dalton and Paul Thompson, uh, they talked about this, this independence, dependence. Uh, they, they talked about this four stages model. And what they said is that when people first go to work, they, they ask a lot of questions, they don't know what to do. And so they, they really need to do that. And they're in a dependent mode. But as they learn, they move from dependence to independence. They are doing projects by themselves. That feels very good. And a lot of people just love that independent mode. But eventually, some people, not everyone, starts to say, well, how does my work coordinate with your work? Uh, how can I help people learn what I know? And so that interdependence mode kicks in. and, and you know, as you think about these stages, you, you see people go through these different stages, typically in a career. And so what we'd like you to do is to look at the first part of the self-assessment. And this gives you your scores on whether you tend to be independent or interdependent. And again, the positive numbers are interdependent and the negative numbers don't read anything into negative and positive because this is kind of a style issue. They're both good styles, uh, but you can see what, what your tendency is towards that. You know, Jack, I was thinking about a lot of our colleagues here at work, and some of them are so independent. You know, they, <laughs> they run off and do stuff, and then you learn about it three months later. <laughs> And then we have others that, that check in and they, they want to get the group, they, they, they gather ideas. They're both valuable. Uh, and, and I, you know, I kind of love the independent people because, you know, if you don't, they, they require no effort. But occasionally they'll do something and you go, that's crazy. Why don't you check with this? <laughs> well, <clears throat> and the point we want to make in the spirit of full disclosure is that we all have a tendency to lean in one direction of independence or, or interdependence. But we are clearly going to encourage you to think hard about collaboration. We're going to strongly advocate that for nearly everyone, a greater degree of collaboration is warranted. Uh, and so whether your scores are high on being independent or interdependent, we invite you to think about what does that maybe say, though, about what I can do to become 
an even better collaborator. Um, and as Jill mentioned, that there is this possibility that sometimes collaboration can go too far. And we found an interesting article that we've cited here, uh, again, from, from the Harvard Business Review, that was talking about the fact that there can be a collaboration overload. Um, and we, we really like the quote here from this senior executive of a global technology company who kind of points out that, uh, you know, the collaborative demands that he was being, uh, you know, were pushed on him uh, really began to wear him down. And the constant email and international travel and all the other things, he was exhausted. And so he didn't feel good about himself and he began to internalize all these different uh, demands that were being placed upon him. And, and literally, you know, we sometimes see people that have to go, go home to get their work done <laughs> because they are so bombarded with requests for collaboration. Um, and, and I've never thought of email as collaboration, <laughs> you know, because you do it alone. But it, but it is, isn't it? I mean, it, it's uh, people sending you messages, you responding to them. That is collaborative. So, again, we're, we're espousing collaboration up to the point where it does not distract from your work or from you doing something which is clearly of higher value. So we know that in general, collaboration is a great thing. We just want to kind of uh, acknowledge that there, there are limits. Uh, we enjoyed the, the, the article that we've cited here because it had also one other, we thought, useful insight. And that was that there are maybe three different sort of components or elements of this thing we call collaboration. One is informational, uh, which is the kind of the sharing of knowledge and ideas and insights uh, and your expertise. Um, there's making available your social networks, uh, your contacts, your, you know, in the old days we would say your Rolodex, but that's no longer <laughs> accurate. Um, but it, it is providing other people with access to, to the network of people with whom you have worked and that may be of real value to them. And then finally, there's a, a personal element in collaboration, which is literally you spending your time and your energy and you being very involved with them. Now, obviously, the, the first two uh, can be shared and there's almost, you know, no diminishing supply. Uh, but the third one, which, which is, talks about the use of your personal time and your personal involvement, that's obviously has a limit. Um, and so we, we think it's useful to be aware that collaboration can come in many forms and that some forms have, you know, virtually a limitless supply of, uh, of juice in that orange or lemon, but others, you know, they're, they're not. So uh, we encourage you to to um, consider that. Uh, we, we found another article that we thought had an interesting idea in it, and that was, what does it mean to be an excellent collaborative senior leader? Um, and the two authors, um, Hermania Ibera and, and Morton Hansen, um, proposed four kind of elements that they thought described a, a very effective senior leader that they played the role of being a global connector. They had this ability to kind of make links between people, often in, in various parts of the world or in different parts of the organization. Um, they are able to attract and engage a diverse amount of diverse talent. Um, thirdly, they, they are great role models of collaboration and uh, <laughs> We used to joke about the fact that, you know, using a, a, an old metaphor, when, when the princes are fighting, uh, the, the spear carriers on the, on the battlefield are killing each other, uh, and the, 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 the princes may be very gentlemanly or nice to one another, but it really cascades down on the organization in very dysfunctional ways. So it's, it's wonderful to have 
a model of collaboration at the top. And the, the fourth um, component that they uh, describe of a collaborative senior leader is that the, this leader now shows a, a strong hand in, in keeping the teams from getting kind of mired in, in debate. And solves the fights. And <laughs> resolves the conflicts. Yeah. Now, we thought it was useful maybe to kind of to bring that down to the levels lower in the organization. And so we've, we've proposed a kind of a, a comparable list, and this is based on our own research and our own thinking. Um, but y as you see them listed there on those, those bullets, collaboration at the other levels in the hierarchy involves, again, your willingness to connect with others by doing the, th the three things we talked about. Sharing, inf sharing information, uh, sharing your social network, and when appropriate, you being personally involved. Uh, secondly, it does involve putting the organization's needs above your, your, your department or your personal uh, goals. Um, thirdly, it does mean that you do all you can to minimize conflict and competition within the group. Uh, there's a bunch of research that would confirm that when you have competitive feelings between groups, if those are left unbridled for a long time, they invariably lead to conflict. Uh, it means you not waiting for other people to come to you, but you kind of taking the initiative uh, and, and as well as responding when asked, but when you look around and you can see that someone needs help, being a truly collaborative leader means you don't wait to be asked. And, and finally, I guess the last idea we would uh, share would be um, between, between departments, between groups, uh, it's easy for things to fall in the cracks. And real collaboration involves you not letting things fall in the crack. If you see something that's about to, to fall through, you reach out and, uh, and make sure it, it, it gets done. So those are the elements that we think really apply to virtually every layer in the organization, not just the, not just the senior leaders. Yeah, you see in a lot of organizations where people take glee when one di division, you know, isn't doing well, and oh boy, that guy's gonna get it, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, and they, they sort of uh, have, uh, you know, it's like I'm getting ahead of them, yeah. and that's that competition thing. So let's go to our research. Uh, we've gathered, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, well, 1.5 million assessments on 100,000 leaders, and we comb through all this 360 data, the first question I want to ask is, well, who do you think is the best collaborator? Well, the senior leaders, they're always talking about it, right? They're always saying, you guys need to collaborate, you guys need to collaborate. And when we looked at the data, Jack, <laughs> <laughs> they, they preach, but they don't practice. You can see here that actually the supervisor which was rated, were rated as more collaborative than the top management. And I think they talk a lot, a lot about it, but they don't always do it. Uh, the second question is, uh, well, how about males versus females? And what was interesting is, is we looked at importance, and, and, and the expectation is, for some reason, that women should be more, a little bit, slightly more collaborative than men. And in fact, they are. They, that's not a huge difference, 50 to 53, uh, 53rd percentile, but it's actually statistically significant. And, and so we find that women tend to, to be more effective at collaboration than men. And not a huge difference, but it is interesting. Uh, if we look at the differences by industry, the funny thing we found is, is that when you look at importance, uh, um, which industry is most important, and then when you look at effectiveness, those things don't line up. That, that where, where people thought it was important, uh, oftentimes they weren't very effective or they were in the middle of the road in terms of effectiveness. Well, finally, what's the impact of being collaborative? Uh, is there any bang for the buck? If you're a really good collaborative leader, does it make a difference? And on this next graph, what we showed you is the effectiveness on just collaboration and teamwork, 
and, and tracking that with overall leadership effectiveness. And you can see there's almost a direct line correlation between these two competencies, that people that are not collaborative are not really considered a very good leader. And if you think of leadership as getting people to do stuff as a group, I mean, that's kind of the definition of collaboration. Uh, the next slide, uh, what we wanted to do is say, well, does collaboration create energy and excitement and engagement in employees? And sure enough, it does. Uh, the worst collaborators, uh, were in, uh, their engagement scores were the 26th percentile, the best collaborators at the 78th percentile. And finally, uh, the thing, what, one of the key variables of, of uh, a leader is getting discretionary effort out of people. Discretionary effort is what people do above and beyond their job, that they go the extra mile, they do more. And this shows the percentage of people that are willing to do more by the level of collaboration. And you can see as people are more, as leaders are more collaborative, they tend to get more out of their people. So collaboration is a key skill for leaders and employees reporting to those leaders skilled in collaboration have greater engagement, have more uh, employees willing to go the extra mile. Okay, so <clears throat> we now come to the question of what can you do to really improve collaboration? Uh, and obviously, uh, there are countless actions that we could uh, identify. Uh, these are very much a function of what unique circumstances the company's in, what industry you're in, what projects you're working on, what stages you are in terms of the growth and development of the firm. Uh, so rather than kind of trying to make a long laundry list of all these specific ideas for collaboration, uh, we thought we would look inside our data. Uh, and again, as Joe says, we have a, a million 360 degree feedback instruments pertaining to, you know, in this case, we were looking at 88,000 leaders and people who are individual contributors. And we're looking at what we could, what we could find from analyzing the data about what did they do? The ones that got the highest scores on being seen as collaborative, were there some other behaviors that they displayed that maybe would help to explain why they were perceived as so effective on this quality of collaboration? And indeed, we saw four kind of fundamental behaviors that, that uh, emerged and that tend to define this, this collaborative uh, capability. And you see them listed there. Number one was builds relationships. Number two was communicates powerfully. Number three was that they inspire and motivate. And number four, they find ways to engender trust with all the people that they work. You know, Jack, the only thing better than 100 good ideas <laughs> is the top four. <laughs> and that's the problem with leadership is, you, you know, there's so much written, so many books, so many, uh, so many pieces of advice. You don't know what to do. But this, from our research, if you do these four things, you're going to be a much better collaborative leader. Right. So let's just talk about the first one, uh, building relationships. When I was a graduate student many, many years ago, um, I had a professor who had just come from Harvard, and one of the things that he loved to talk about was uh, a sociologist who was a very wise, very well-published and often cited sociologist at Harvard, a man named George Homans. And uh, Homans had this very simple theory which is indeed so simple that it doesn't seem like it would be uh, worthy of a Harvard sociologist, but the theory was simply this. Sentiment leads to interaction, and interaction breeds sentiment. <laughs> Isn't that profound? In other words, collaboration is very much driven by the nature of the relationship, and we've all seen this in action. When you meet with somebody, spend time with them, interact with them, you feel more warmly and you feel more positive toward them. And when you feel more warmly and more positive to them, 
you're inclined to want to interact with them more often. You'll, you'll call them up. You'll invite them to go places with you. You'll do things. You'll have lunch. And so this, this circle of interaction breeds sentiment, and sentiment breeds interaction is indeed very true, and we all experience it on a, on a regular basis. Um, so let's just stop and think about this. If we want to be perceived as being more collaborative, one of the things that we might want to think about is, what am I doing to build relationships with the people inside the organization? Do I invite someone from another department to come and talk to my team about how we work together and what we could do that would be more uh, effective and how we could help them uh, in, in, their, in their work and their interaction with us? Uh, do we create social events where people get together? Do we do things deliberately that truly build relationships? That is the number one most important kind of component of collaboration. It is. It's a very important thing. Uh, the second one is communication. And this is actually the easiest skill to, to improve on. And it's not so hard to do, but we blow it all the time. Uh, you know, it just makes sense that if you want people to collaborate, they need to know the what, where, when, and how. They need to be well informed. And most people drop the ball on communication. And the problem with communication is if you do it just once, that's not enough. You've got to kind of regularly uh, provide that communication, let people know what they need to do, where the progress on a, on a particular project or, or a goal and objective. They need updates regularly. Easy thing to do, easy not to do. Very easy not to do. The third component <clears throat> is labeled inspires and motivates. And this describes the extent to which a leader generates excitement and enthusiasm. As you recall, going back to the original definition of collaboration, it was the ability to get people who are not in your power base, people who don't report to you in an organizational sense, and how do you get them to adopt a common cause um, a purpose, a mission, and work together to achieve that. And so this ability that, that leaders have to, to keep focused on the cause and keep focused on the purpose and to emotionally connect with people um, is really the, a, a major key to this competency that we've labeled collaboration collaborative behavior. The last one, uh, last the best of all the game, <laughs> this is actually true, uh, it's trust. Because if you have those other three and you don't have trust, we're going to show you the data here in a minute, but it just ruins everything. Uh, so, it, it, you know, if people don't trust you, all the other stuff falls apart. Uh, trust is built by, you know, number one, positive relationships. We've already mentioned that. Two, uh, people trust others who have insight, judgment, uh, expertise, or talent. Uh, so sharing your expertise, sharing your judgment. And the third thing is consistency. I do what I say, I say what I do. And so, again, and, and, and I want to show you the impact of doing these well and, and what happens, Jack. And there's one more thing I think on trust that needs to be mentioned, and that is that um, if you take those three components and then you put, you draw a line under them and say, it's all divided by what people perceive as your self-interest. Mm -hmm. if, if, they, if they think you're doing this because of your desire for self-aggrandizement or, you know, your, your selfish reasons, then that really begins to diminish all of those three. Um, it does. So uh, we have a lot of data, and because we have a lot of data, we can simulate what would happen if, and so the first thing we simulated was, well, wonder if you were above average on one, two, three, or four of the, the, the four behaviors, and what you see there, and, and above average, we're just saying just above the 50th percentile. If you were just above the 50th percentile on all four of these issues, then your average effectiveness and inspiring would be uh, in the 70th, 79th, 79th percentile. Um, and so that's pretty good. 
you know, that's not bad. And so one approach you could have uh, to kind of improve your ability to collaborate is just do all four reasonably well, just above average on all four. So that's one approach. There's another approach. <laughs> and Jack and I found early on this value of building strengths, this idea that if you are really good at a couple of these, uh, and, and actually what we find is if you were good at two of these, you end up being at the 84th percentile. If you're just good at one, you almost get to what you would do as if you were above average on all four. So you can use either approach. Uh, and, and the question is, do you see value in all four? Are there a couple of these in your job that really stand out? And once I say that, let me show you the, uh, the big but. The big but is, <laughs> but if people don't trust you... <laughs> If people, if that's a fatal flaw, and a fatal flaw is is you're in the bottom ten percent in terms of your effectiveness on that thing, if you if if you can do all three well, but if they don't trust you, it just the bottom falls out. You're at the tenth percentile on your collaboration. So trust is very critical. Uh, actually, the others can't be fatal flaws either. And so the logic here, as you think about it, is. Uh, you can use this kind of, uh, I want to be good at all four. That's not, you know, that's an interesting objective. Or I'm going to be good at a couple. I'm really good. I mean, 90% at a couple. But I always have to look and ask myself, are any of these a fatal flaw? Am I terrible at any of these? Because they're all very important. And so if, if, if you have, and especially trust, ends up being really important. So what I'd like you to do is if you look at your results right now, what we show you is, is on your assessments two things. The first one is your preference. Your preference is your energy and your excitement about doing something. And so we show you the four uh, different dimensions and we show you your preference. And again, the higher the number, the stronger the preference. So you can see on this slide here that, that, that this person has a really strong preference for trust and a pretty strong preference for uh, communicating powerful. Powerfully, And then on the second part, section three on your self-assessment, we show you your effectiveness. And this is where you rate yourself on these items and how is this an outstanding strength, a strength, am I competent, needs some improvement, needs significant improvement. And you can see which one you score yourself the highest on. Now, we just need to throw in a caveat here. Self-evaluations are interesting. <laughs> But oftentimes, you can be off a little bit on your self-assessments. And what we find is, is that if you, are, if you have a fatal flaw in, in, in one of these, you're going you're gonna to be off. You're going to see yourself as more positive. If you have a really profound strength, you're going to be a little more conservative. So the only way to get a really accurate assessment on this is using 360. But this gives you a direction, and, and uh, we find that oftentimes the self-scores can be directionally accurate unless you score very high or very low. And the last slide I want to show you there is we show you what the norms are. So you can look at your scores on these three or these four, and you can compare it to the norms. And this is the average score, and you can determine whether you're above average or below average on the four issues. So let's talk about how to increase your ability to lead. And the, the, this graph here, this, this uh, chart here, it just gives you this idea about when you look at effectiveness and preference. And, you know, let's say that you have a high preference, low effectiveness, high need for change. And, again, the organizational need is another critical element that we need to mention because – uh, we didn't assess that on the self-assessment, but what does the organization need you to do? What do you need to do in your job to be successful? Uh, so if, if you're high on preference, low on effectiveness, and high on organization need, that's easy to improve. Now, on the other hand, if you're low on, on preference, low on effectiveness, but high on organization need, well, then you better do it. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a kind of a must-do. It's a do-or-die kind of a thing. If you're low on all three, oh, man. <laughs> well, let's just make sure that's not a well, fatal let's flaw. Not, let's hope it's not trust. Huh? Yeah, yeah, let's hope it's not <clears throat> trust. 
All right, so we're going to encourage you to, as Joe said, this was a micro learning experience and not just something to, to listen to, but really to kind of act on. Uh, we would invite you to kind of think about which of those two approaches would you kind of lean toward using? Uh, do you want to make sure that you're above average on all four of them so that you are more inclined to be a, a good practitioner of collaboration? If that's your approach, then obviously what you might want to do is to look at these four and say, ah, is there one of those that I'm not doing as well as I could? Do I not communicate as, as openly and freely? Do I not communicate as frequently as I should? Uh, am I working on building relationships? Uh, am I extending myself? Am I making sure things aren't falling in the cracks? And so you, as you look at those four, you might just say, which of those would I kind of elect to work on uh, and to make sure that I'm at least above average on all four of them. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are using the second approach that Joe described, which is, can I really be terrific at a couple of these? Can I really excel at being a great communicator? Can I really excel at being very inspiring to the people I work with? And by the way, there's, there's lots of different ways people in, uh, are inspiring. Uh, and, and Joe and I have written a book called The Inspiring Leader, which, which talks about the wide variety of ways that people can, can go about uh, being, being more inspiring. But if you're going to choose the second approach, then you say, OK, what can I do to really be outstanding at a couple of these? And if so, what, what, are, the, you know, what are the two that you would really choose to just knock out of the park in terms of being effective because that will indeed put you up in the in the top 10 percent of all leaders in terms of their ability to be perceived as highly collaborative so um, we invite you to, to, to select one uh, to work on one or two and uh, begin that process and when you uh, fill out kind of your appraisal of this of this uh, webinar um, you will have access to a development guide which will give you some suggestions on how you might go about building whatever strength you've chosen so if you would like some concrete kind of palpable ideas about how you can be better at inspiring or how you can be better at building trust or any one of those four, uh, you can access this via the, the, the document that you will receive when you complete the post survey. So our takeaways from, I hope, uh, from today's webinar would be these. Um, the key is to kind of make a new habit of collaboration. Uh, and, and like all habits, the, they, they begin with you paying attention to some, some triggering cue that says, oh, am I, am I reaching out and extending myself? Am I doing the things that would kind of make me perceived as being a good communicator? Uh, am I really building relationships? Uh, what, is that, what is that cue? And how do I be more attentive to that cue? Um, and then how do I take the first step? Uh, you know, there, there are obvious things that, that are the tip of the spear when you begin to do uh, and be better at communicating or be better at building relationships. And that, you know, that independence uh, versus interdependent orientation, the, the independent orientation people, they, they need to create their own cue, right? Because they, they're right. sort of like, oh, I'll go do this on my own. And, and uh, a lot of times you have to ask yourself, who else needs to know this? Who else has some information that I could share? I mean, you have to force that cue a little bit more if you have a more of an independent orientation than a collab or, or an interdependent orientation. And I, I think the third idea we would just share with you um, would be as you're commuting home, however you do that, whether you're on a subway or driving a car or whatever you do, 
uh, you might just take a minute and say, what did I do today that made things better? Uh, what did I do today to really extend myself and be a better collaborator? Uh, it doesn't need to take a lot of time, but it could be just a little routine that you have that says, um, I can deliberately change this. I can create a new habit, and uh, I'm committed to being perceived as being a highly collaborative colleague. Uh, we, would, we would conclude today's webinar with a quotation from the legendary old football coach, Newt Rockney, who, who made this, this uh, I think, interesting kind of comment. Uh, the secret is to work less as individuals and more as a team. As a coach, I play not my 11 best, but my best 11. <laughs> and that, that idea about you, you uh, pay attention to those who are collaborative and work together as a team because they will win for you in the long run. Thanks for joining us in today's webinar. And uh, we, again, uh, encourage you to kind of complete the, the assessment at the end. And um, We would love your feedback. And what uh, this next slide that comes up shows you uh, the link to that webinar. Sometimes the, the feedback survey automatically appears. Sometimes you have to go to this link, bit.ly slash webfeb20. So if, you, if, you, if the survey didn't automatically come up, go to there. When you complete the survey, you can give us some feedback. We love feedback. And you can also download the development guide uh, and, and share that. Uh, it's been a delight to be here. This has been a real collaborative effort between Jack and I. We, <laughs> we have uh, we've learned a lot about collaboration, haven't we, Jack? We have written six books together, and if you ever want to really learn about collaboration, <laughs> write a book with a co-author. <laughs> yeah, right. It's a really good learning experience. Right, but but at the end of the day. I always find it's better when we work together. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. All right. Thank you so much.